So I had um, this uh, this old guy come to me. This dude was 80 fucking six, 86, f- decrepit, all right? And he comes to me and he's all like depressed and like down as down like in his mood or whatever. And I'm like, like, what's up? What, what What's the issue? And he came for other issues. He has like a, a laundry list of, of uh, problems. But uh, the reason he was so depressed, he's like, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to need the, the pills. I'm like, which pills? He's like, you know, the pills for, for manhood, the pills. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he, he, meant, he meant like Viagra. He meant like sildenafil is what he meant. Uh, and I was like, uh, oh, yeah, like, have you had issues? And this was the, his, his, like, you know, current issue. is like, oh, my whole life he's never had a problem uh, getting it up. And he's like, oh, I've always had, like, nice, strong erections, all that kind of stuff. But uh, since last year, since he turned 85, recently, <laughs> it's not that he can't get an erection. It's just it takes him a little longer <laughs> than normal. <laughs> And he was like, oh, and he feels like it, like a front to his manhood and stuff. And apparently, he's still yeah, good for him and his wife. He, they're still going at it at, at that tender age. Um, but uh, do you call old age tender? <laughs> call it very tender. What a champion he is! But how do they find their genitals at that age? You know, all the skin is all loose and like the JJ and the PP. It's all hidden under the tummy. Oh. It's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but at least there's a sense of adventure to it every time, you know, you do it. You search for the treasure trove. I was going to say, by the way, Yegopnik, not to uh, twist the move, but um, I thought about you today. I saw a patient, and I don't know, I was reminded of you as an uh, <clears throat> older he lady. Was fucked was up. For a while. Made me think of you. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was a dumb, dying. Fucking, no, no. dumb was motherfucker, dumb. man. Yeah. Super cringy dude, bro. No, 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 no. It was just it was just a lady, like a middle aged lady, and she's had like issues because of smoking or whatever. And just like I was going writing my notes about this lady, and all for some reason I couldn't get you out of my mind. I was just Aww. like, oh, like I really should, I really should suggest to you, go like, like to stop smoking, man. I need to do a better job because <laughs> <laughs> I was seeing. Well, well, yeah, no, maybe no, I, taking, I didn't want to. Buy. I'm taking it as a compliment. Yeah. That means you actually have feelings for me. Uh, and you of know course. you actually want me to be healthy, so our love life can continue for a pretty decent amount exactly. of time. Yeah, so so you won't be like the old man. So when we're in our eighties and nineties, you won't need the uh, uh, the Viagra to continuously. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Baby, I, oh, I eat suzuk every shit. day, yeah. coupled with some <laughs> good homemade rakia. Both come from the grandpa down the street. The suzuk and the rakia trust me i'll get it up <laughs> even when we're over in heaven or hell probably you me in heaven <laughs> my dick's gonna be so long i'll fuck you for heaven bro <laughs> dude the other day i had to go check some guys for him <laughs> i'm uh. so sorry and it's yeah and uh it was a couple of th- like there was a guy and there was a woman the woman was uh Bless her, she was just very embarrassed by the entire thing, so it was okay. But the guy was, uh, you know, sometimes you have people come and they're un- unapologetic about, like, whatever fucking filth they're going to show you. Um, and, yeah, like, I just had to sit there with a nurse in the room, and I had to fucking, like, imagine, like, you're going to dig through the dirt, like, your fingers, like, claws. Imagine that you're going to do that. I put my hands like that around his fucking ass cheeks and just, like, pulled them apart oh, <laughs> so I can get it. <laughs> look at his fucking Did you have you shit know, on it? hemorrhoid studded asshole uh, oh, no no he was thankfully clean okay. he was thankfully clean matters, but there was there know? was once a guy who was uh, yeah and then you have to fuck it you have to look at his asshole then you have to feel inside then you do a rectoscopy you basically bring this dildo shaped thing that's way too long and you insert it into a person <laughs> and it has like a, a lightsaber attachment that's like uh, to, oh, to basically um, light up the inside of the, the, uh, the anal canal does it make the sound too? So you stick this fucking the light. No, sadly, sound. no. I wish. It did. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Uh, it you, 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 know, you know the Konami, <laughs> the Konami sound, the Konami sound. You know when you start Metal Gear One, it's like do 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 that. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. So you, you you fucking stick this thing inside the guy, and then you like rotate it, and then it, literally it's like a lightsaber. It all lights up, and you can look all the way to the end of his fucking uh, uh, like well asshole basically uh, into the depths, and mm-hmm. then you see it's like okay, he has internal or external. I'm always depending. Um, yeah. And uh, some people are like unapologetic and some people are very shy. And I don't know who I prefer more. <laughs> 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 the unapologetic people are more are easier to handle. Right. Yeah. But the, the, the people who are shy have a bit of shame. You know, um, I had one guy who just like literally he sat and he, he decided to just pull his fucking cheeks apart for me. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. I didn't, have, I didn't even put the fucking gloves on yet. <laughs> Uh, howdy, y'all. We got a problem. Um, I am a, a uh, business owner. I run, you know, several um, 
homophobic chicken stores here in Texas, and uh, nobody <laughs> wants to work anymore. So uh, I, th- I think I'm I'm probably just going to kill myself um, because that's kill the, yourself. That's the K Y S K Y S. <laughs> have you guys do you guys see those those signs where or those little uh post-it notes they put up where you live like here in here in the states it's very common you'll see outside businesses like mcdonald's or wendy's or whatever mm. they'll put up signs like oh sorry we're we're short staffed nobody wants to work anymore because they're a bunch of entitled millennials <laughs> oh my is that God. just a u.s thing i think it probably is that is definitely a u.s thing Fuck that very shit. much so oh a God. u.s thing yeah and then underneath they write, but we're willing to let 12 and 11-year-olds work for yeah. $3 a day. <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. I, 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 so I read the stupid thing. Like I didn't actually read the article. I just read the headline because I didn't. I was not in the fucking mood to, to read this. But some state in the U.S. was like actually considering uh, allowing 14-year-olds to work to solve the labor shortage yeah. that's fucking <laughs> yeah. happening in retail jobs. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, uh, <laughs> McDonald's is offering reduced pay for for 14 and 15 year olds which is perfect for them because wow. they get uh Mashallah. they get to fix their little labor shortage but also they get le- like child Under labor day. and they don't the kids don't understand they're being exploited the way the previous workers did so it's a win-win yeah what i don't understand is is it like a legal thing that if they underpay them then technically it's not child labor because a 16 year old is doing the same job an 18 year old is at fucking right. mcdonald's why aren't they getting paid right i, I think that's what it is i'm not so certain mm. i think also what it would be is there would be like a, a whole hubbub among the conservatives if they paid children the same rate as adults because oh well, these kids they're mm. just kids they don't need this money they're at school what are they going to spend mm. it on candy kids are coming over the border <laughs> taking our jobs <laughs> <laughs> you imagine imagine they they give they give oh equal Lord. equal pay to children as adults uh, republicans will immediately be pro abortion <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, fuck it. They're they're about right. It's like they're against abortion until the kid is born, and then afterwards they're like, oh, it can it can rot. Food oh, stamps. What's you're that? You're starving, huh? <laughs> <Go> fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> defund, defund, defund. <laughs> Not like the Democrats are any better. They're both fucking the same. Two sides of the same fucking garbage. I love can. how Hakeem yeah, feels like he has yeah. to say that sentence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the Democrats can lick my balls. I couldn't fucking give a shit. Because you had the KGB. The this was oh, a deep but- program yeah, joke. Yeah. If you understood that joke, mm. you have watched mm. more than three episodes. <laughs> Thank you for donating. <laughs> <laughs> At the tone. Anyway, uh, this week we are going to be talking about the Great Resignation, as it's being called by the, the breathless media outlets clutching their pearls and reporting <laughs> on this uh, this new trend. Um, where there are a bunch of people who have just decided that, you know, this job kind of sucks and I'm tired of being worked to the bone and treated like dirt. So, where do we want to start? Uh, I, I, I could take that. Um, first of all, just in the future, if anybody tells you about the, this, the great resignation, you can tell them to resignate these nuts. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's fucking stupid. Resignate. That's so stupid. I'm sorry. But the great resignation still is <laughs> right. kind of relatively okay, but the quit-tagent... Is absolutely oh, God, yeah. or the oh, quit demic. Oh Lord! Oh, oh my balls yeah. just get tinier and tinier the more I keep saying it because <laughs> I keep turning into a short-haired white woman every time I fucking say it. That works. It works. You know where she works? She works in HR. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! The image. Ah, oh fuck! That is a that is a crime. That is a. I'm a victim of communism now for for <laughs> for being exposed. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about is. Uh, just like JT said, the stupid, yeah, great resignation nonsense. I want to start off uh, all of this with the discussion of um, class consciousness uh, because it kind of relates, but not really. I think we'll build up on this at this point further. But first of all, let's define what class consciousness is. Um, it's not simply just like, oh, you know, my fucking job sucks, so bye. And th- that's not what class yeah. consciousness is. Class consciousness is specifically an understanding of the class relations behind the current capitalist system that we live in. We live in a society. Um, it's understanding the relations to the means of production. What does that mean? That means that you, as a worker, as a member of the proletarian class, you have to sell your labor power uh, to a capitalist in return for a wage. You have no m- means of production, no factories, no vast tracts of land, no uh, natural resources, nothing. 
uh, to your name that you can use to basically make wealth for yourself. So you are forced to basically sell your labor power in return for a wage. Meanwhile, um, capitalists on the other side, the, the bourgeoisie, they do have class consciousness. They have it actually quite extensive uh, for their own class. That's why they run everything. But uh, the, the the point that I would just like to highlight is just because somebody's quitting doesn't mean they've become class conscious, even though that point has been kind of thrown around a, a bit. Mm. And it's very important when we define what class consciousness is, it's very important to understand what you are supposed to use it for. Because I feel like uh, it's often misused even by Marxists themselves as a sort of excuse for why everything is so shit in life and why they can't do anything about their own conditions. And that's literally the liberal, the liberal id of, you know, your brain talking, mm. not uh, the materialist part, you know. You need to use class consciousness <clears throat> as a tool to rile yourself up into, you know, understanding that mm. you and your fellow workers are carrying the world on your shoulders and that as such, you need to fucking mm. take what's yours. It's, it's only depressing mm. if you yeah. think that this situation is permanent and that it's going to be permanent, which okay, it's it? not. Uh, but that's you're exactly right. It's it's to be mindful of the fact that there is a perpetual contradiction between uh, the working class and uh, the capitalist class, and that these contradictions cannot be resolved. You can't uh, find harmony between the two classes. You can't, uh, as some fucking class cucks say, oh, you need the workers and the capitalists. No such thing. The workers are the ones that do fucking everything. Um, Actually, and, the one uh, that's the most into uh, the, the ones that are the most masturbating about uh, so-called class collaboration are who. Ooh, fucking fascists, literally. So be very yeah, careful exactly, with yeah. that sort of rhetoric. Yeah. The, 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 the nation. Oh, the yeah. nation. Oh, I'm going to cool. Why can't we all just uh, get along? I want work, uh, world class yeah, peace, yeah. but not for the Jews. <laughs> Fuck it. Li- yeah, Jesus Christ. Liberals liberals can fucking. Oh, my God. Anyways, with that being said, though, when you see what you what's we're going to discuss further what's happening in the U.S. But right now, when you look at it, um, there's some sort of disorganized labor resistance of some form uh, in the U.S. But this isn't the first time this is happening. Of course, there have been many different instances from the 20s and 30s to the 60s and 70s up until today. uh, And even within the 21st century, this has happened several times. Um, But is there something different this time around? I would say personally, yes. uh, And that's up to uh, the guys if they think uh, otherwise. But number one, that there are are no overarching institutions that have taken part in this um well the quit tagen <laughs> of this the uh, uh, these people like leaving their jobs there's no uh, like ooh you know central committee planning this um Unlike in the 20s and 30s, where there were uh, socialist parties that did have at least some hand in the, in the labor resistance of the time. Of course, COVID has, has made um, the, the econ- economic situation in the United States much worse um, than it has been even already uh, as, as a post-2008 economy that has still not recovered. Um, so that definitely gave impetus for, for this. Um, and of course, something to note is that the vast majority of the people who are quitting are fairly young. Like, I'm, I'm Gen Z-ish or, you know, like young millennial. Very young people. And, uh, of course, um, something that I think uh, Yopnik spoke about, like, in the notes, um, which I think is very interesting, is this this toxic work culture that is uh, dominant in the U.S. That there's a somewhat of a break that happens uh, between the, this newer generation and how they perceive, you know, you shouldn't be some fucking, again, not to use this word again, but a cuck for some fucking company thinking like, oh, the more work I do, the more I'll be rewarded. I'm going to take on more fucking responsibilities that I need to. And somebody will notice. And then eventually it's the fucking the uh, company owner's son that gets the fucking promotion and not you. Uh, yeah. The one thing we, we do need to really consider is how much of this movement is a burgeoning class consciousness and i personally i think it's kind of it's hard to say i do agree that this does seem different than kind of previous movements like this um mm. you see stuff like nominally socialist groups have really grown pretty rapidly since the start of covid um and union activity is really picking up but that being said a lot of americans especially cops uh, have quit their jobs over vaccination requirements. So there's at least a portion of the population that's not only not class conscious, but uh, very deeply reactionary. Then you've got the like the mm-hmm. anti-work crowd, r slash anti-work, which has become r slash mm-hmm. uh, reform work or work <laughs> reform or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's like there are some people who don't make the connection between not liking their boss and alienation under capitalism. So... I'd, I'd like to hear what you guys think about what the breakdown is there between 
actual class consciousness growing and just like a we don't want to work anymore kind of thing like the business people are saying in my opinion and based on the statistics i've seen and uh, the reports i've read it's kind of a uh, the next stepping stone towards actually potentially achieving uh, class consciousness because if in a in a country such as the us but also in different uh, imperial core countries in the West in general, there has been this dream that has not only been sold, but has been genuinely embedded in the spirit and in the culture of the local population, which quite directly states and tells you that you should be loyal to your country, your nation, and most importantly, Mm. to your employer, because you're going to get something in return. Back in the day, you know, you would, but this is changing because back in the day, you would abandon your dreams of becoming, I don't know, what uh, what did the people back in the 70s or 80s want to be? I don't know, a cock, coke snorting disco dancer. You know, you'd abandon your dreams of being a <laughs> big bulge in skinny, shiny pants dancing on a stage and pursue <laughs> the exciting life of accounting because you know that accounting job (laughs) would actually be secure you know it would help you buy a house hell two houses have a car give your wife or husband a car give their lover a car raise three four kids easily (laughs) and potentially even you know get them through college and what about today i mean are the employers paying us enough to abandon our dreams? Is there at least some sort of stability that we can get for not gambling with our future? You know, used to be you're you're alienated from work, okay? Go home, drink the good beer, watch the big TV in your massive living room, enjoy that comfy, I don't know, couch or sofa, and now it's, I don't know, pizza for the third day in a row, some Twitch streamer that uh, Mm. won't talk to you unless you donate 50 bucks that you don't have and a job that can call you 24 7 to show up so wages have at this point fallen to such an extent indirectly and directly inflation we're going to talk about this later uh, that they cannot pay off this alienation that has been bubbling up in everyone so they i mean they never could in my opinion but today it's it's hella obvious to everyone so tldr is it class consciousness? For a lot of people, I genuinely think it is. But yes, they are a minority. But for the uh, for the other ones, it's it's this uh, crumbling of uh, what everyone thought was real, but never really was right in front of their faces. I mean, the capitalists themselves say there's no free lunch, and there isn't, mm-hmm. at least not in neoliberal capitalism. And the bill is coming, mm-hmm. and the workers are feeling it. And when the mm-hmm. workers feel it, the other motherfuckers that make their money off of their backs are going to feel it as well. I think that's a very good point. Um, something that, uh, like, again, talking about the idea of it being class consciousness is it depends on how people view it uh, at the end of the day, on, on how they understood what is happening around them. Because, at, like, a very like simple idea, just so people um, uh, fully understand, the, the concept of the reserve army of labor, of course, you have yeah lots of unemployed people and that keeps wages down and it keeps workers desperate. So you basically accept whatever job you need, right? Um, but the thing is that if workers are entirely employed, for example, uh, then that increases the collective power of the working class. That's why there's never been full employment. But paradoxically as well, if workers refuse to work... So they're not exactly, um, uh, they're not exactly, um, sorry, the it's okay. a phone call. <laughs> no, it's his vibrator, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gave me, he gave me a little, uh, you know, it's connected to Wi-Fi, remote not Bluetooth, control. remote control, <laughs> and we play a little game all the time, but he doesn't know I also gave it to mm. JT, so I was very surprised <laughs> that it started up, because JT is a kinky motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. But yeah, um, what I was saying was, um, yeah, uh, but also parad- uh, paradoxically, when workers refuse to work, um, then also that is a form of labor shortage that in its own way increases the working class's power. This is the idea of, of basically a general strike. Um, 
And in a way, this is kind of similar to that, just very disorganized. Um, but a good idea to remember is that even though, I, I don't know, millions have decided to quit their jobs, um, a substantial minority hasn't seen this as, you know, oh, like, you know, for the workers and whatnot. A substantial minority has seen this as, oh, maybe I can join the the, the, the ranks of, of, of the business owners. Ooh, um, because uh, the amount of, there's been, I think, over a million um, uh business submissions like um applications uh, submitted uh under these like two pandemic years or last over the last year i believe yeah um showing that yeah there is some level of petty bourgeois aspiration compared to what is a working class reality that like this is just a temporary thing this will end right and then these people will have a a, a situation um <clears throat> where it will go just right back to the way it was, where people will be forced to take shitty jobs that they don't want to take because fundamentally the, the, the wages of the United States aren't going to improve, and f overall in the world entirely, generally. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a, a side point that I want to build no, up but on. It's, well. it's a very important side point because you know it shows uh, something quite fascinating, at least to me. You know, startups going up in numbers – uh, shows exactly what you said, petit bourgeois aspirations, hoping that you can find a place to put your capital so it's safe before uh, the crisis hits really hard so that you can take it back out uh, later, you know, buying apartments so that you can become a landlord if you have enough capital, you know, moving into uh, trading stock, etc., etc. But with the people actually starting up businesses or becoming freelancers or starting up one-people businesses, you know, to me, that kind of shows that... You know, people, yes, they don't want to live under the constant pressure of the employer's boot, but in a neoliberal setting, all that they know that can be a solution to this is what? Is them becoming the boot. So, you know, if you yeah. don't want to work for someone else, you should work for yourself, which is a great thing to do, I, I think, until, you know, working for yourself actually means a bunch of other people working for you. So it's, it's, it's a, in my opinion, a br brilliant cultural mechanism uh, that, you know, capitalism develops to trap any inkling of class consciousness and corrupt it by, by turning it into something, you know, completely different. It literally capitalizes on, on alienation and it calls it entrepreneurship. Oh, he said it. Oh. Yeah, and, and, yeah and, it, and it turns <laughs> it into entrepreneurship, you know. It was, back in my university, we like to joke around the entrepreneurs, calling them enterprick nerd shit. I know this is a 12-year-old joke, <laughs> but I, I just will never, every time I see the word entrepreneur, enterprick nerd shit. Uh, entrepreneur is one of those fucking things. It's a word I hate because whenever anybody describes himself as an entrepreneur, that's just another way for saying fucking uh, uh, what's it called? Unemployed. Yep. <laughs> no, honestly, from <laughs> most of the time I see. And by the way, you know the stupid. There's this weird meme on the left. It's like, oh, like spell bourgeoisie, and then it's like, oh, you know, people are fucking cringy because they can't spell it. Fuck that. Bourgeoisie is easy to, easy to spell. Fucking entrepreneur, eat my <laughs> dick. It has like 17 <laughs> fucking vowels. <Impossible. vowels. laughs> Sorry, you were gonna say something, JT. Yeah, I was just gonna ask if you guys have seen that uh, TikTok that's been going around. It's like uh, he's, he's saying it's the a free money hack. Where he's like, oh, you get a writing job a remote writing job, and then you just hire these people from other countries to uh, to write your work, and then it's free money. <laughs> like, that's the kind of thing that these people are, these are the aspirations they have. They want to make a T-shirt company by using child labor in other countries and having them shipped over here. They mm. want to do the free money hack with the outsourced writing. Mm. So that's <laughs> You really want to something as that. well. So we have a third explanation of the so-called self-employed businessman and businesswoman uh, and business non-binary person, uh, but uh, <laughs> that like what Hakim said, what I said, and then what you said, and with your specifically, I'm just thinking like nowadays, yes, somebody finds a, out a freelance job and then gives it to some poor person over in my part of the world to fucking do it for them, and then they get the cut. Where did all the gangsters go, bruv? You know, back in there, you, you go and you racketeer a motherfucker. You steal from a fucking old lady walking down the street. You sell some fucking heroin, man. You know, when the economy is tough, you just do fucking crime, you know? Now, now everybody with all these fucking platforms, everybody's got a podcast, everybody's got a YouTube channel, everybody's fucking shaking They're ass, shaking ass for like a million bucks a month. 
What's up with the, yeah, fucking NFTs and shit. Fucking where where's the old school fucking gangster that's going to actually shank you? Gone. He's gone. You know where? He's fucking online and he has a podcast about gangster shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's been outsourced. Yeah. He's been out he's been outsourced. He gets some guy from Bang- Bangladesh to come over and stab you instead. Uh, <laughs> oh fuck. But I was going to say um uh, I, you brought up an interesting point. By the way, for anybody who's, uh, yeah, th- this is a very American centric discussion. At the end, we're going to talk about how this actually affects, uh, like people around the world. But this is a very American phenomenon so far, so that's why we're discussing it. Anyways, um, a very good point that you opening brought up, which is the uh, the the inflation thing, and basically what what can a modern you know, uh, what can the modern working class, an average American, like, young person, what do they have to look forward to? What can they fucking afford? Um, and something that I found funny is, you know, this, this, the talk that's, like, getting at least some traction. It's like, oh, the $15, uh, what's it called, minimum, minimum wage, fucking $15. And I still remember, it's, it's 2022. I remember in 2008 <laughs> conversations about fucking, uh, what's it called, um, about about a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Yeah. Like at this point, it I don't know. Is it supposed to be like twenty eight dollars or something in the U.S. to catch up with inflation? Some shit like this. Yeah, if it had just kept up with inflation, it should be over twenty four bucks an hour. But uh, that's yeah, that's it, unreasonable. We got to get to fifteen first. Yeah, please, please, <laughs> just give it two years, and they're gonna confirm the fucking thirteen and a half or whatever. Yeah, Jesus. Um, in in some fucking American states, they pay like seven dollars an hour or something. Oh yeah, yeah. What and, the fuck? In um, so a lot of places here, like uh, Sonic, for example, um, you get a a what's called the tipped minimum wage. So if you're working in food uh-huh. service, uh, you they don't have to pay you the federal minimum wage. They can pay you like five bucks an hour, and then the rest is assumed and to be made off of tips. Filled. Yeah. Which is isn't Sonic like a? Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that like a fast food? Place? Yes, Sonic's a fast food place where you like park in a stall, press a button, give your order, and then people come out sometimes on roller skates to give you your food. And the idea is that you tip uh-huh, them. Okay. But there's no easy way to do that. Like unless yeah. you're carrying cash, yeah. like, there's no way to mm. facilitate that on the screen. What the fuck? The U.S. is a, is a dystopian, man. What the f- <laughs> people come out in roller skates and fucking. Oh my! And I can imagine them now. Oh, the, st- the stupid the COVID regulations. So they're just wearing the shitty gloves and masks that they, that they probably <laughs> yeah. just con- continuously reuse. <laughs> Here you go, citizen. <laughs> fucking <laughs> like a, a fucking smashed burger, or whatever the fuck you guys yeah. eat. Dude, the other oh, week, Lord. the other week, I'm sitting, I'm sitting with these. I'm not gonna say their nationalities, but a bunch of foreigners, and uh, they, they live, they live in, they live, <laughs> no, they. None of them are from Eastern Europe, but they live here, right? And there's one American, and uh, we, we get kind of buzzed, and we start talking about, uh, uh, you know, how much, who makes uh, at work. And obviously, the one who really felt awkward about saying it is the American, because uh, you guys really are scared of actually talking to people about your your salary. And I don't know if you're more scared about talking about it when you make very little because of shame, or when you make a lot because of massive shame. <laughs> but <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but uh, this this dude who is from a Central European country that uh, was under the so-called Iron Curtain up until uh, 30 years ago is chilling, and they're both in the same industry, and they both work the same jobs and the american you know says his uh, his salary and he's living in eastern europe paying eastern european taxes and working for a completely u.s based uh, uh, company completely remote that he started working for before he moved over here right i think he moved for his uh, for his partner uh, and he says his salary and you know in everybody's brain jt you might not know this uh, but everybody around the world for some reason when you hear american salary you think really high like you think okay they are the people that make the most money on planet earth right and this this central european dude is uh, literally uh, leaning back in this irish pub drinking his beer and smoking a cigarette and and they're doing the same bloody job and the american says uh, i don't know i think he said 55000 or 60000 a uh, a year after tax which is i don't know like 80 something 85 maybe before tax uh, and, and and the central european dude fucking splurts out his beer his fucking cigarette <laughs> flies all through the fucking roof and he's like i was thinking maybe in five six years to actually migrate to the states but dude i make more than you and i pay less in taxes and i live uh and i live mm-hmm. in a country that's literally four times cheaper what is this story <laughs> up, uh, supposed to uh, lead to it's supposed to lead to that the, the myth at this point of of you know the american wealth 
is is not even a myth yeah. at this point it's just a lie it's it's mm. absolute bullshit mm. people from even developing mm. countries are making more money than people in your uh, struggling states and even you know average states do which uh, I hope comes as a surprise to our American viewers who I encourage to emigrate. You're very welcome. Yes. <laughs> mm. Jesus Christ. It is, th- that is definitely a true thing, though. I mean, JT, you have lived, this is your country, and I'm, and I'm so sorry that it is your country, but <laughs> 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 my condolences <laughs> that it is your country. Um, but I was going to say, the, the fucked up reality of like having to, working a minimum wage job, and again, like this weird idea that's like, oh, it's a minimum wage job, so you shouldn't hope to fucking, you know, ha- earn a living wage yeah fuck you all right but uh, yeah how they like you can't get an education with the amount of money that you earn you can't afford rent you can't afford groceries what the fuck can you do is it like supposed to be like a the weird idea is that i guess the assumption is that it's always pocket money for like 16 year olds even yeah. though like the vast majority mm-hmm. of people are like middle-aged working i don't know you can tell me about it jt yeah that's the thinking the the argument is that uh no you know upstanding adult would work at mcdonald's these are just jobs these are intended for teenagers anything that pays minimum wage is intended for students in school who don't need the money right they don't have many bills they live with their parents but obviously that's not the case like have you ever been to a restaurant like during school hours, they're open. They're open. There are adults working there. The, the, the students are in school, mm-hmm. and there are adults filling those positions. So it's it's very frustrating to hear that because it's so easily debunked. Um, but you've also got problems like so those adults who work there, they can't afford anything because that the wage is assumed to be for people who don't have bills, and yet. If you look around the country, there's not a single county in the U.S. where a minimum wage worker can afford a one a one bedroom apartment, and so that's that's before. What are you talking about? Why don't you move to fucking butt fuck nowhere, Arkansas? Okay, Chattanooga <laughs> <laughs> is that a place? I've heard I've heard something oh, like yeah, this I've got, before. I've got a <laughs> I got a buddy who lives in Chattanooga. It's actually kind of expensive, and it's so. Is it is yeah. it a real place? Oh yeah, Chattanooga, <laughs> Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Hakeem yeah, just oh, say a random word and JT was like, oh yeah, that's a real place and I have a friend from over there. <laughs> you have a place from Booga Booga no, Town? I, 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 must, I, I, I just must have heard oh. this. Jesus Christ, it has a population of 180,000 people. Yeah, the Noog. It's a big place. Wow. <laughs> the Noog. The Noog. <laughs> I don't know okay, if anyone calls it that. I just call it that to bother my friend. Oh my God, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, it sounds too way too similar <laughs> to a racial slur. Be careful. <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> well, shit. Oh, yeah. it isn't. It is in the oh, South yeah. after all. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean yeah, that is true. I am very proud of myself how I didn't think know. that it could be a racial slur. Like I'm so not racist. Oh my God, tapping myself on my <laughs> oh Slavic my back right now. Woo-hoo. <laughs> First of all, by the way, they have a website, chattanooga.gov, but not this. That's not the funny part. The funny part is that I'm the getting a heart attack TV every time you say it now. Like, why did you sorry. put it in my brain? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, the mayor is, is uh, of Chattanooga is Tim Tim Kelly, and <laughs> and it says he defeated Kim White in the runoff election. Have you heard any more Caucasian fucking shit than this? <laughs> Tim Kelly and fucking Kim White. Oh, Kim White can Kim, White, Kim White could be like uh, a person with Chinese oh, heritage whose parents were like, okay, we need. We talked about this, this in the pre- previous a, episode. Yeah, this is not an Asian person by any measure. Of the, oh <laughs> Jesus Christ! CEO of River City Company in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's Tennessee, not Arkansas. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, sorry to all our <laughs> listeners in, in Chattanooga. You don't know every U.S. state and city, you dumb foreigner. Uh, what? Why does Tennessee's flag look like a bad bowling ball? What the fuck is this about? A lot of state flags um, are not very good. They look like shit. I'm sorry. To say, I'm I mean, most I flags look like shit. Like, let's be honest. Do, this episode is already like a shit talking the U.S. <laughs> kind of. I mean, no, I'll shit talk my part of the world. Like literally half of the countries on my peninsula really like uh, mutated chickens. Like half of the flags have two headed fucking uh, eagles on them. You know, <laughs> yeah, and even countries eagles. that like really hate each other. So, yeah. so like the Albanians are like, uh, we uh, don't know colors, so it's a blackbird, uh, and it has two heads on a red flag. And then the Serbs are like, ha ha, we'll make it bling bling, so it's blue red <laughs> and white and like the bird has like gold on it and it has like a sword and like a shield and like a byzantine symbol and the and then the montenegrians run in and they're like i don't know what's going on and their flag is a combination <laughs> of the two <laughs> it's fucking it's beautiful so yeah it's not just you guys much respect to the to american flag makers it's not just you guys it's uh 
all over the place. We're very bad at flags. What the fuck are you talking about, uh, Hakim? Like the Middle East, bruv? All of those fucking flags look the same. You're like Scandinavia, I mean, don't, man. Don't you dare like, they're all the fucking same. Our gorgeous, our gorgeous, our gorgeous, uh, beautiful <laughs> flags. The red and the white and the black and the that that stunning green. Of course, it fills you with pride. It's, <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing, by the way, for people. Like, I, I never understood. There's some people who are like, oh, why don't we have a more colorful flag? Fuck you. I like the flag. It looks nice. Uh-huh. It looks, you know. Like, of course, everybody changes the, the, the meaning, right? The old Iraqi flag with the three stars was supposed to represent the United Arab Republic. And then it started representing socialism. And then they got rid of the stars because it's stupid. Now we look very g- generic. Um, but yeah, like what? You want to look like Oman where they have a weird like Khanjar? <laughs> Fuck that. Um, I was going to say, by the way, the Oman flag is actually not that bad. Um, but I was going to say, Chattanooga has its own fucking um, font. Chat type. The typeface <laughs> used in Chattanooga. It doesn't look that bad, actually. <laughs> this, this is where your tax money is going. <laughs> Special fonts. Oh, wait, when I, when I write Ch- Chattanooga, I only get... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Weiber, Chattanooga, Edad, Biografia, Peliculas, Noticias, Filmografia. I get an actor called Pedro ah. Chattanooga. <laughs> yes, I apologize. Yeah, oh, that's it. And he played in the movie called mm. Compadres Mexicana, made by Unison Comedia. Mm, wow. That's amazing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to our oh Jesus Christ the state of American infrastructure they have a picture called Market Street Bridge facing the North Shore and it is like the it looks pretty decrepit if you farted on this bridge it would fall apart <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, I'm, it's, I'm gonna yeah. go pour myself another like, vodka yeah. while you talk about uh, Chata Chata <laughs> Slur Chata, Chata Slur Town <laughs> oh fuck they film there's their movies Chattanooga and its environs have been featured in numerous films since the early 70s particularly due to the Chattanooga being the home of the Tennessee Valley Railroad Railroad Museum uh-huh. a fucking, what <laughs> which has allowed its equipment to be filmed ah okay okay I thought it was just because they li- really like the um the museum yeah Chattanooga's uh actually a pretty cool place it's got a good music scene uh art stuff uh and you know crumbling infrastructure like the rest of the country yeah i mean pretty much okay well very nice to know uh if anybody is from chattanooga please add us on twitter um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take back all the criticism <laughs> if you do i mean yeah, it looks it looks it looks okay it looks like pretty much every other uh, uninspired american city sadly i don't know i think only the places that were settled early on look half decent and I, maybe this is not right to say but i think most of the south looks like shit <laughs> uh, this is just my personal opinion i'm sorry to say Jesus like new Christ. york looks kind of cool chicago looks kind of cool as well i've never been to to these places but i've just seen photos um but when you see like austin texas or something i'm like oh god look at those roads all, <laughs> why is there a gas station like You're every five fucking texas. meters <laughs> yes. i'm so sorry you texan so <laughs> no sorry. i will protect it come on <laughs> Yeah, so, um, uh, oh, U.S. Okay. Southerners are, are like honorary Slavs because they're stupid, insane alcoholics. But, <laughs> racist? But, uh, no, not racist. Uh, you can say everything about Slavs, just not racist. Okay, we're the only white people who, true, who haven't done this. Okay, uh, but yes. Uh, yeah. well, let's get back to topic because JT is going to want to kill himself. He's going to want to kill himself. <laughs> Anyway, getting back on track, the minimum wage will not afford you basically anything. You can't afford a home, and if you can't even afford a home, then you're not even going to get to the bills that you'll have when you have a home, like uh, electricity Mm. and water and trash and school and childcare and groceries (laughs) and medical bills and and all this stuff. The post office office in Chattanooga will kick you out. I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, all right. Yeah. That kind of leads us into to what we wanted to talk about of uh, inflation a little bit, and and what mm. has happened to the income of of the average American. So, uh, Hakeem, you want to jump in on that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So basically, for those who are unaware, um, the United States is facing, I think, not the highest inflation in in recent history, but fairly fairly decent amount of inflation. Um, uh, and this is, by the way, interestingly, because of how annoying currency markets work, this has also affected the um, uh, the price of base goods um, around other places in the world. I think in the UK, for example, um, uh, goods like rice and and potatoes and shit like that have um, also um, risen. S- some of them are 150, even 300 percent the original price, which is insane. Yeah, real inflation where I live is 10 percent. Like real inflation is 10 mm. percent over here. I don't know mm-hmm. how it is in Iraq. Sorry for well, interrupting, but it's, you, you, it's don't <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear. You don't. You guys, ten percent is like a good, a <laughs> good like, year. Yeah. Oh my god, the economy is stable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fuck. But yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And then, and then, fifty years, and in fifty years, finally, Iraq's inflation goes down by three percent. And you know what you start hearing? 
The American Anthem. Tum, tu, 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 tum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to do oh, that No, no, but you're completely right. Anyways, but what I'm saying is, yeah, so what this means is that uh, not only have wages been stagnant, in real terms, uh, purchasing power has declined. The amount of stuff that you can actually buy with your wage, even though your amount, the amount of money has slightly increased, the actual worth of each single dollar bill uh, is has reduced. So as a result, um, you have a bigger pile, but it can get you less of the stuff. Uh, which is one of the beautiful um, contradictions of the of, of the money system, especially under capitalism. Uh, not to mention that, uh, of course, inflation exists under socialism at different points, but it happened for different reasons. This is another fucking topic for another episode. Fuck off. Okay. The famous Hakeem <laughs> disclaimer. Voice in my head, fuck off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Thing is, though, uh, I, I don't think this is particularly ooh, controversial to claim, but I don't think that American purchasing power had ever been all that great. I mean, maybe in the 70s and 80s, like up until the 80s, it had been to a point increasing. But at this point, um, there's been a, a steady decline. Uh, and if it wasn't for the, the the perpetual march of industry that manages to reduce prices of production and, and uh, allow for goods to be produced cheaper and cheaper, the real effects of, of um, uh, inflation would be much more severe, despite the fact that they already are, in a way, uh, very severe. Um, but uh, I was going to say, uh, trying to link this to the class consciousness point and COVID point, there's a point that um, Yugopnik uh, had that I thought was very cool. Do you want to jump in on that? What makes this uh, case of the so-called great resignation so uh, different in the eyes of many, but in my opinion, is pretty much a repeat and an in- intensification of uh, uh, what the, the situation has to lead to with, you know, the regular 10 to 15 year crises that occur in, in capitalism is, you know, the impact that COVID had on uh, on this whole situation. To quote uh, one article that I read, the pandemic functioned as that reset, creating a mental escape hatch from the immiseration and even danger of ordinary work. If you call someone an essential worker for long enough, they start to believe it. They start to wonder whether they deserve more given their essential nature. Gaining courage from social media, the most vulnerable people in America have started the closest thing we've seen in a century to a general strike. And while this quote resonates intensively probably with uh, all our listeners and with me, honestly, uh... We need to remember that it is not a thing that is only related to this pandemic or pandemics that happened before or economic crises that ensued. Uh, Marxists have always claimed uh, and even capitalists themselves have understood that the market and the way it functions does have to go through these sorts of cleanses eventually. Are these cleanses in these moments of crisis and uh, economic uh, recalibration, as the capitalists like to call it, is it going to come because of something like COVID or is it going to come when somebody finds a loophole the way we've seen in 2008? That part is inevitable. But what uh, Marxists, at least Mar- uh, Marxists that I agree with, genuinely understand is that uh, in moments of crisis, if organizations and working class movements do their job right, they can utilize that moment in, uh, in which most people struggle They can utilize it to explain to them why it is that they are struggling and why it is that when the bill comes to be paid, they're always the ones paying it, just like it happened in COVID, which uh, with COVID, which kind of leads us to to arguably, in my opinion, the most important aspect of this whole discussion, which isn't even necessarily only about the Great Resignation, but about the COVID crisis in general, which is how can the working class, uh, how can working class movements actually utilize the situation as it is for its uh, for its own purposes and for its uh, uh, own um, own ideals, right? which I guess we can we can talk about and we can touch on, et cetera, et cetera. It's also super critical, I think, to realize that every time a crisis like this comes along, you have forces on the other side trying to capitalize on the, the instability. So like if you've read Naomi Klein's book, uh, Shock Doctrine, they'll implement these kind of disaster capitalism um, plays to 
privatize things more heavily, to roll back regulations, to take advantage of the average person's suffering in order to make a, a quick buck down the line. So last time with, um, with the 2008 recession, for example, a lot of people lost their homes. They defaulted on their payments and were evicted, and those homes were snapped up by firms like BlackRock, and they're still held captive on the rental market to this day. So I think we're going to have to expect to see the same thing happening here with COVID and with the Great Resignation. We've got an enormous uh, reserve army of labor ready to kind of take up the slack of people who have quit whether they don't want to get the jab or because they're genuinely learning that, hey, I'm being exploited and this is wrong. So it's just something to be aware of that we need to fight back against. While we're trying to build this class consciousness, we also need to to keep an eye out for these these forces that are at work. You can't be more right. Absolutely. Like reactionaries are going to use the situation no matter what, and they already have. So instead of uh, explaining to someone that uh, their wages aren't being increased, even though their boss is still making uh, the same uh, average profit rate that they made three years ago, uh, instead of explaining that you know the, the the employer is a direct counter thesis to their own um, to their own living wage, uh, the, the the reactionaries are going to say COVID fucked up the economy and COVID was created by the Chinese, therefore fuck the Chinese or whatever stupid shit like that, right? So if if the if the working class does not uh, manage to uh, uh, take the the brunt at least the as big of a percentage as it can of this conversation, someone else definitely will. I think this also ties uh, again into the, the perception of what's happening uh, and also the, the results of it. If you look at the demands of people who want to um, or who are leaving their jobs, their demands are very, if, I, if we can word it this way, very social democratic in nature. Um, either it's on an individual basis where they just want a better wage, for example. There's nothing wrong with this in and of itself, but we have to remember, again, in the grand scheme of things, does that does this help a movement? Does this grow class consciousness? Not really. Um, uh, there are no overarching institutions, of course, um, and if it, people are stuck in the idea of, uh, I just want a better wage um, or better working conditions, then they don't fundamentally get to the issue of why they are in the situation that they are, which is the capitalist system and the relationship to the means of production, all right? Um, it's one thing to, to want a higher wage, and it's another thing to uh, fight for a higher wage whilst also understanding the background of why your wages are low in the first place, why working conditions suck, why you aren't given insurances, why the state directly supports your employers rather than your claims uh, or, or, or demands, for example, uh, and one of which kind of keeps you in a, uh, well, uh, lack of class consciousness, if we can word it that way, and in the latter, w meaning the one with uh, an actual um, organization where there's some thought behind it, this one can actually be used to push a, a and propel forward a, um, a working class movement that in the end can get so solid gains for the working class, not just a temporary raise or just a temporary, you know, oh, you know, we're going to allow you to work from home, you know, none, none of this shit, like actual uh, tangible benefits that the working class can hold on to. And hopefully, of course, once under, in, in socialism can solidify because I uh, always, to remind, there are always concessions in capitalism that can be taken away. Uh, of course, this is not also to mention that the question of ownership hasn't been brought up at all from what I've seen in, in the discourse. Nobody's ever, nobody has spoken currently of the very fact that, hey, the reason workplaces suck is because we don't have a say in our own workplaces. We cannot decide how to organize them, what to do, who gets what responsibilities, how we're paid, how our insurances are covered, if they're covered at all, etc., etc. It's one thing to have them not be covered. It's another thing to have uh, democratic conversations about these issues and coming to basically a, a, a consensus uh, between all those who work and all those who work, of course, having a say in, in, in uh, their workplace. Yeah, I think a lot of it right now is that Americans don't actually understand what they can demand. Like their their conception of how the labor landscape looks or can look is so intensely limited because most people don't remember a time when there was any kind of militant labor movement. I mean, they're, they, they only mm. remember times of workers being afraid of bosses and not the other way around. Mm. Um, and I think that's that's a, a huge thing that we need to get back is that 
employers should be afraid of the people they employ. I mean, that's mm. they're yeah. they're not just mindless tools to be used. These are people with lives that deserve to be uh, compensated fairly, at the very least, for their labor. Are you some kind of communist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been found out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I go on. <laughs> no. I mean, that's about it. it. It's reassuring that the largest increase in resignations that we've seen is among industries considered essential during the pandemic so low paid workers that at least shows that millions of these low wage workers are fed up with being treated like dirt and so i think that's that's a very positive step in the right direction and if we can kind of channel that into a a direction of understanding the the powers at work behind why their job is terrible and why their boss treats them like garbage then we can start to see some real movement i think um, exactly. There was this really terrible video put out by CNBC. Um, I mentioned it in my video recently, but it's it's about how people can take control over their lives and improve their work experience. But all of their solutions hinged on individual action and counterproductive action at that, like talk to your manager. If you talk to your manager alone, you're just going to get fired or take on a side hustle, which, you know, in the U.S. just means uh, selling your soul to any number of, like... Drop shipping. Yeah, drop shipping, <laughs> delivery companies, <laughs> running your car into the ground for nothing. Uh, and their final so- solution was just find a new job, which is, like, great. I'm going to find a new job that pays exactly the same or less because now there are plenty of places that are hiring and plenty of people that want to work. And so the, the employers will be like, yeah, you can come work here. Let me pay you less than what I paid the last guy who quit. And that's frustrating, but there were a bunch of comments on that video that were at least somewhat reassuring. Like a lot of people were saying they're fed up with being treated poorly, um, that they deserve better pay and more reasonable hours. And critically, the, the most important one to me is that it's time to make business owners afraid. And that, to me, is is a real kind of signifier of a willingness to engage in in. Uh, labor militancy, which we haven't seen in a long time in the U.S. Beautifully put. And and, and again, just to round back on, on what was previously said with this point, it is on the organizations, on the movements, and organizations that are going to spawn and be created in the future to take advantage of this very real situation where people are understanding where they are in the local hierarchy, at least the local financial hierarchy, but they don't know how to put it into words and they don't know uh, what direction to take it in. And if they're, they're taught to understand that this is a systematic issue and that it's not only related to this COVID problem or the 2008 crisis or the 1856 crisis, but it is going to keep happening over and over and over again unless genuine systematic changes are brought uh, to the forefront. Uh, If that is actually shown to them, if they are actually introduced to that, uh, I, I believe the the vast majority of people would uh, it it would resonate with them. So uh, it's 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 on the it's on the working class movements of the U.S. Uh, to uh, to see what they can do about uh, utilizing the situation as as best as possible. And when it comes to the West, usually they were relatively successful in utilizing it, but never really to to a massive extent. As Hakim said, you know. Even some of the most successful, let's call them progressive moments in U.S. history, which was uh, FDR and so on, the, the high point that was ever reached is, you know, these concessions with uh, with the bourgeois, where uh, massive improvements were, yes, absolutely, no discussion, given to uh, to employees, but which... Unfortunately, I genuinely wish we lived, <laughs> the, the system wasn't as parasitic as it was and that that would be enough, but it led to the eventual uh, abandonment of those rights and kind of a rewind to a previous uh, previous point. So, uh, but I just want to make sure that like the our listeners don't think that we're, we're these uh, fucking, you know, 
dudes with uh, dicks up our asses constantly being like, oh, but that's social democratic. That's not real communist movement. Oh, you guys is <laughs> literally not. We're arguably, I would say, some of the most pragmatic motherfuckers of all time on here. I mean, how pragmatic do you have to be to, to get an American, an Iraqi, and a Slav in a fucking room? I mean, mm. that's pragmatism <laughs> right there, baby. Uh, but all, all we're saying exactly. is we're trying to look at this from the fucking, in the fucking long perspective, in the long run. And in the long run, when you... Uh, when something's given to you by the guy that's bigger than you, you should be sure he's going to take it back. So the idea is remove the big guy from the equation as a whole. That's all I'm saying. TLDR, people's war now. Is what <laughs> we're saying. Okay. Liberate Chattanooga. <laughs> uh, there's one, one uh, very good point. Um, are you okay? <laughs> you sound like you're having <laughs> I'm, I'm, losing, I'm really <laughs> dying of laughter here. Yeah, it's, it's all right, uh, I was going to say there's this one part. There's a, one um, point that I think uh, you got to me that's very nice. Um, and I think this ties off into kind of like the, the rounding off of this entire topic, which is why... Okay, JT is, is the American here. He's the resident... Um, uh, what, what is a yank. derogatory term for American? <laughs> yank. Yeah, he's yeah. a resident yank. Uh, <laughs> but uh, why in the hell are, are uh, you Gopnik and Hakim talking about this? Um, I'll tell you why. It's because... There is a vision of the world because th these resignations happen to different extremes and uh, uh, different countries and at, at different periods of time. That's not what, why we're discussing this. We're discussing this because as people from the third world uh, or at least ooh, the imperial periphery, uh, forcibly un underdeveloped or um, overexploited countries, we have certain segments of our population, in fact, large segments of our populations that seem to look at the United States as a shining city on a hill. They seem to think or really truly believe in uh, this idea of the ooh, the American dream, despite the fact that the vast majority of Americans don't fucking believe in this shit, right? Um, I remember George Carlin said something uh, fun, which is uh, it's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it, which is, yeah. Um, but the, 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 there is truth in that, that there are people who maybe in, were in the Balkans or in the Arab world who look at the United States and think, oh, you know, that's where I want to be. That's, that's what we should be more like. Not truly understanding how much of a, a, a anti-human system it runs, right? Mm -hmm. Capitalism fucking sucks everywhere. But if you had to pick a capitalism, I think the American type, uh, is not that much, uh, is, is, is not exactly the, 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 the cream of the crop <laughs> let's say um by the way do crops have fucking cream what is what does this shit mean <laughs> what the fuck does that mean i never right? thought about it actually <laughs> Oh, fuck. Uh, clean ben is clean crop fuck it's another one the, the, yeah exactly yeah I mean, the penises can have fuck. <laughs> ben is gonna have cream <laughs> crema but I was gonna say, uh, another one is, is uh, creme de la creme what the fuck does the cream of the cream mean <laughs> what the like oh the best of the fuck it's all cream I don't know, it's you supposed put to be on a cake, you, you put cream on a cake like, and then you put some cream on top of the cream on the cake and then you have but the cherry on top you, and you have, have a fucking emotion of different you creams on top, you know? okay uh, I'm, I'm not gonna stand here for this fucking <laughs> 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 I don't I don't yeah whatever uh, maybe some baker or some shit can can correct us um, but yeah I don't want to be corrected these are stupid sayings all right it's like the fucking I don't know what's on the stupid the the uh, God, there's too them. many too many American yeah. ones yeah, on. the only one that I like is hold your horses. That one's nice. Don't be in, a fucking, in too much in a hurry. Hold your horses. That makes sense. Everybody fundamentally understands hold your horses. Yeah. Uh, who the fuck understands, uh, I don't know, fucking... Uh... Foot the bill. Yeah, for, yeah exactly. <laughs> Foot the fuck. Exactly, man. <laughs> what were you talking about? That, about? You were saying there was an interesting point you got Nick made, and then we uh, devolved into the American <laughs> dream uh, being oh, yeah. like a beacon yeah, about the American stupid dream. ass kids all over the world. Exactly. It's it's stupid. It's not what you see in video games. It's not what you see in movies. And I remember this is actually something. Maybe a lot of uh, the the people, third world listeners, will will kind of um, uh, we'll see eye to eye on this, uh, or that we'll, we'll they'll. What's the fucking? How do you say this in English? <laughs> They'll not recognize it. No, they're, they're yeah. familiar. They're and familiar by the way, fellow experience. listeners, That's just so you know, like say. we actually do have a genuinely international audience. Yes, fifty percent of them come from the U.S., but like the other fifty percent is genuinely from all over the world, which makes me so fucking proud. Like it actually resonates yeah, to them. Yeah. 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 So yes, please continue, Hakim. Yeah, for an English language podcast, that's very good, I think. But anyways, uh, to, to to mention. I don't know if you guys remember Home Alone, the the movies. Oh yeah. Um, but when I was a kid, I really liked the Home Alone movies. Um, and uh, I would watch it, and I would see, and even as a kid, I was like, 
That family is living in a house that fucking big. They're lying. Yeah. There's no fucking way. <laughs> There's no fucking way Americans live like this. But I know there are people who probably saw this, and their and their experience is always this. Like they show like fucking Friends or other garbage that people yeah. watch Seinfeld. I don't fucking know. Um, they always show like it's like a oh I'm a part time waitress, but I have like a fucking two bedroom apartment <laughs> in central New York. You know, like the 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 way they bullshit people, right? Um, yeah, that, that, that's just kind of my point. But it is important, you know, the, the, the American dream as a concept falls into an, you know, ev- as it falls into an ever deeper abyss, the, the working class movements all over the world need to make sure that, you know, we dial that shit up to the fucking loudspeakers, you know, so much as, you know, mm. the, the, yeah. the developing world believes the only reason, I mean, I've talked about this 500 times, but the developing world believes that the only reason they're not wealthy is because their country is too barbaric and not well lubed up as, you know, the U.S. is, you know, a fake reality that needs to be addressed and properly shown as absurd to kids with, you know, dollar signs in their eyes, uh, which, you know, I, I I should know because I was I was one of them. Uh, but it, it uh, mm-hmm. and that's going to become much easier to do as uh, Americans themselves mm-hmm. get more and more uh, disenchanted in what was sold to them throughout the throughout the centuries. So. Mm-hmm. We just need to, yeah. the, the rest of the world also, exactly. the, the, the working class movements from the rest of the world also need to make sure they capitalize on that, which now that I said it sounds mm. ironic, working class movements <laughs> capitalizing on something, mm. but uh, but yes. <laughs> Take advantage. Somehow, somehow debunked. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, um, I don't know, are you guys familiar with the, the fucking show Modern Family? Yes, um, and I, I, it, I, I have uh, watched the shit out of it, actually. It's not, it's not bad actually. It's it's a nice. Uh, it's not the stupidest it's thing. It's not. It's not. And I'm in love with uh, what was her name? Eva Longoria. Jesus Christ! I'm in love with that woman. I am <laughs> absolutely in love. With that woman. I could I could tell you'd be the type. Yeah. Yeah. But I was gonna say, um, uh, again, the the the, the um, idea there, of course, it's something called Modern Family, and it is basically like a bunch of nuclear families. But all of them have like uh, interracial marriages, uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural. There are some homosexuals, ooh, like on TV, ooh, you know. <laughs> and they have an adopted Asian Intergenerational, kid. Intergenerational, yeah. Yeah, like it's just, and all of them have fucking massive houses, right? And they all drive fucking brand new cars, and none of them fucking work, it seems, right? Um, one of them sells fucking closets. I don't know. So and, that uh, show, that show is not as bad as other sitcoms because it kind of touches on it with uh, the richest person the older man from being married to an absolutely gorgeous Latina woman who also brought her son who she kind of is like the the normal person in the show that sometimes reacts to like what the actual fuck you guys are complaining about this you know because there's many episodes in which they're complaining about something that's extremely fucking that you know people all over the world would beg to complain about and she would come in with a rant and actually put them on their place which sounds actually very progressive but as i'm saying it can be used kind of as a small narrative tool to tell americans stop fucking complaining about you know being exploited as fuck which you guys absolutely are you know you you could have it worse you can live uh, under under putin mm. under putin TV? who TV? doesn't wash his pp <laughs> who will, yeah. who will yeah, fuck exactly. you with a bear up your ass under, you know? but, yeah exactly under putin <laughs> <laughs> fuck me god oh jesus christ americans please either pronounce something right or just don't fucking talk um i was <laughs> sorry <laughs> but <laughs> like, uh, uh, really, like, fuck, Vladimir, really? Is that, is that fucking, right, <laughs> fuck. Anyways, um, oh, Jesus Christ, I remember there was a, I'm not even gonna get a, get into it, Jesus, I guess talk about it all day. Um, maybe one day we'll do a bonus episode, bonus episode, oh, we'll yeah. talk about fucking mispronunciations and how much they annoy us. Um, but I was gonna say, you know, one episode, one, sorry, sorry to bring this up again, one episode of Family that I found funny is, uh, apparently the kid of the, of the Latino, uh, Latino woman. Uh, he visits some like family in Mexico or whatever, and he kind of has a crush on all of his cousins or whatever, uh, or a friend of the family. And she's a communist. And the weird, the image that they have of her is that she's always like, um, she's always just down about the world, and she's always just angry. And it's like, oh, like you're not supposed to be having fun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and like at first, I laughed at this, but then I thought about it. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's not too far. That's not too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's two types there's two types of communists uh, in the world 
the one buried in like seven ton seven tons of books, uh, semi depressed, reading at three a.m. And another one doing a fucking line of coke over <laughs> out of somebody's ass. Like, <laughs> you, know? you, you could have just said there's two, you could have said there's two types of communists: Hakim and Yugothnik. <laughs> and then the same <laughs> ones, the actually same ones that are going to change the world, like yeah. JT. You know, like exactly. Yeah. He has he, he he has a stable marriage. He has a you know <laughs> two dogs. He has social interaction. <laughs> Oh fuck! He keeps things alive. Oh fuck! You know I don't want to get fucking though, so, because I'm like so fuck that. Uh, I don't. You know, there's yeah. always a mind. <laughs> yeah, something that we learned, of course. That I'll, is I'll, true. I'll, I'll be looking at your. I'll be looking at your liver tests. Oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll send them over. <laughs> Stab a motherfucker. I swear. <laughs> oh fuck! Liver oh, is the only word that triggers me. I will not. Because I don't have <laughs> one. I am. I. I swear. Uh, fuck! I swear. I. I swear it on my fucking on the honor of my fucking name. I'm gonna be the. Uh, the assigned physician to this fucking group. I'm gonna look. Yeah. At, I want blood results from both of you cunts, so I can fucking make sure you're gonna live. <laughs> <laughs> you go there especially. Like, Dude, but you know, you oh, you can't have you can't get blood results for the spirit because my spirit is the healthiest one here. Anyways, yeah, where <laughs> the fuck did we, we wrap up for? <laughs> So bringing this somewhat back on the rails, our point being is that the way that the United States presents itself and its media abroad and the way it is in reality are two very different things. And those that um, in the third world uh, that look at the United States usually fall and fall very badly for the this first image of it being, you know, like I said, the shiny city of a hill, on the hill. Um, meanwhile, it's actually the, the you know, the, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the what's it called? The um, Mr. Incredible memes, the becoming uncanny. <laughs> 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 that shit uh, but yeah it's it's the, it's the third image right when you, you the first and third image is when you compare the united states how it portrays itself and what it actually looks like um because you end up with people who have to work teachers or people with master's degrees who have to end, end up working two or three jobs just to be able to make uh, ends meet um and they're drowning in debt they have credit card debt um their infrastructure is crumbling their uh, society is turning increasingly militaristic um despite the fact that the vast majority of the population does doesn't have access to decent quality healthcare um, that is affordable or at least free, which it should be. Uh, instead, the the, the government and, and uh, politicians decide to spend all that money on uh, increasing military expenditure that is completely unnecessary, more than the next 10 countries combined, uh, among many, many other things. That's the reality of the United States. Just because somebody can go and on occasion in the extreme rarity can, can uh, establish some level of wealth doesn't negate the fact that the vast majority of people who try to go and make it in the United States don't actually make it. They just barely scrape by a living uh, and usually die miserable deaths. Um, there's a bit of hyperbole there, but also um, it's to counteract all the uh, bullshit you've been fed by fucking, I don't know, the Big Bang Theory with the fuck, oh, the unemployed waitress, <laughs> and she has it like a fucking, fucking, yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> and with that said, um, I think that's a nice way to wrap it up. Uh, please do remember that uh, when the revolution comes, uh, all the class uh, enemies will be hanged uh, on the shores of Chattanooga. I don't know if Chattanooga has shores, <laughs> but we will usher in the People's Republic of Chattanooga. Um, and, Between uh, Chata and Nuga, the U will have a little star. It will be censored. Don't worry. The communists do not stand for discriminatory sentences and words, <laughs> which Nuga absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I feel oh horrible god. even exactly saying right. that fucking thing. And that, that, like, well, yeah. uh, all right, whatever the fuck, enough, enough uh, dilly dallying. Uh, this is the program. <laughs> dilly dally. That's another one. Fuck, sorry. <laughs> 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 another stupid shit. Anyways, um, yes, uh, this has been the program. The program. I'm Hakim. I'm JT. And I'm Yugopnik. And there is no cream on top of crops. All hail the People's Republic of Chattanooga.